Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you, the listener. Thanks to all of you, including Dale Mulcahy, Matt Zaglin, and Kelly Cook. Plus, hey, welcome in new patrons, Brian and John. Brian and John, welcome, everybody. <laughs> On this episode of DTNS, OpenAI announces that her is real, what's really behind the U.S.-China tech war, and turns out the internet is, in fact, good for you. Have more. This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, May 13th, Monday the 13th, 2024. <laughs> In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. Uh, from deep in the heart of Texas, I'm Justin Robert Young. And I will not break any mirrors today. I'm the show's producer, <laughs> Roger Chang. That's good policy, Roger. Mm-hmm. Good good policy on Monday the 13th. A lucky day for open AI, I would say, don't you think? Oh, certainly so, Tom. A lot to chew on. Mm-hmm. Yep. The jerky of AI announcements there, there, coming. There, 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 there might be a few mirrors broken in frustration down in Mountain View, but other there than might, that. Yeah, there might be. You might yeah. uh, see someone Sundar their Pichai over this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, enough of that. Let's start with the quick hits. The magnetic storms over the weekend in the Northern Hemisphere not only showed auroras for people much farther south than usual, but also caused some technical issues. Farmers experienced issues with GPS that guide autonomous tractors. Uh, In some cases, it could cause an incorrect path that would not be recognized later when the machine was unaffected. So it thought it was doing the right thing, and then later it'll go, where's the path? It's not where it should be. Uh, And Starlink satellites also experienced degraded service on Saturday because of interference from the storms. Three people tell the Financial Times that the EU is preparing to issue a formal charge sheet against Microsoft for violating antitrust uh, regulations, restricting competition in the virtual meeting space of its operation of Teams. Microsoft offered concession, including unbundling Teams from Office, but that may not have been enough. Teams does not have data portability, which hinders moving to new systems like Slack and Zoom. Microsoft might still be able to offer more concessions to avoid the charges. Microsoft (laughs) facing antitrust, the 90s are back. Yay! Just like on Eurovision this weekend. Uh, In a follow-up to Sony's requirement to have a PlayStation Network account for some PC games, uh, it has removed that requirement for Helldivers 2. We talked about that before. It has not removed that requirement for Ghosts of Tsushima's multiplayer mode. Even though the single-player mode of Ghosts is playable without an account, uh, Steam, Epic, and Green Man Gaming are canceling and refunding pre-orders if you live in one of the more than 170 countries that do not have PlayStation Network access. Apple and Google finally announced uh, their intent to join the Detecting Unwanted Location Tracker standard that will alert users through iOS or Android if a tracker like an AirTag or Tile is moving with them without their knowledge. Trackers from Samsung, Chipolo, Eufy, Geo, Motorola, and Pebblebee are all part of the standard as well. The update is rolling out now on iOS 17.5 and Android 6. Yeah, there there was a bunch of shade thrown on Apple for not uh, adopting this when Android tracking was announced as a feature a couple weeks ago. So here we are. Everybody's everybody's happy again. Uh, Apple's first unionized store in Towson, Maryland, has authorized a strike after failing to reach an agreement with Apple management. Uh, The store's hundred or so workers are part of the International Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers Retail Coalition. Authorizing the strike means they can set a date for a strike, but they haven't done that yet. So there's no strike yet. It just means they've got the go ahead from the membership to set one should they see the need to do it. The sides have agreed on most issues, but still have disagreements on work life balance, scheduling and wages. And they are going to resume negotiations on May 21st. All right, this is going to surprise a few people. In fact, I've already seen it surprise a few people on the Internet. The Oxford Internet Institute did a study on how Internet access affected well-being. And in my opinion, my purely lay person's opinion, they did it freaking right. 169 countries were surveyed, and they found that the Internet, in most cases, makes your life better. The study gathered data from 2006 to 2021, so they had a nice wide and into the modern era swath of data. 
And you're like, okay, but how many people? Is it one of those representative samples of 12 people or 2 million individuals no. between the ages of 15 and 99? Seems like a good sample. They, uh, they didn't just have it in the Americas or Europe. It included Latin America, Asia, and Africa. And they uh, analyzed the data with nearly 34,000 different statistical models and subsets to kind of try to look for biases in particular models, etc. What they found after doing the work the right way, in my opinion, was that people who had internet access or actively used the internet, in other words, maybe they didn't have it at home, but they used it a lot uh, during the day, generally reported greater levels of life satisfaction in 85% of cases. That doesn't mean it's always good. Uh, in fact, 5% of cases showed a negative effect. So you got 10% cases in there that are kind of ambivalent, doesn't seem to make your life better or worse. Uh, but they did find 5% of cases showed a negative effect, uh, mostly in women aged 15 to 24. So some of those indications that maybe social networks in particular might have a negative effect on younger women uh, seem to be showing up in this wider, more rigorous data. Uh, Justin, I, I, I can't repeat often enough, this is what I've been waiting for. Someone yeah. to do the work with enough data to say, okay, let's actually see where the harms are. And to see where the benefits are. And that, that and ultimately the is where, are. Yeah, absolutely. Where, 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 we've, where we've come to. It, it is not a surprise to me that these are the results in that we are the living proof of these results. If you are listening to this show, and I know Tom and I have had so much of our conversations dominated by cool things that we can now do thanks to technology. And while it is always healthy to identify problems, and I do think that it is a, uh, uh, I've always referred to America's self-loathing complex as its superpower. Uh, and I do think that that is broadly a good thing to do in, in forever, wherever you're listening to this. It's good to highlight the negatives so you can work on them and make them better. That's what like an immune really response like. kind of right. Yeah. yeah, exactly. But I don't think anybody can look at the benefit of the, the passive benefits that we get to the internet every single day and say that this is not going to be as uh, uh, not going to be a net positive. And that's what I, I think you saw through an exhaustive study with this. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 you may have heard me say this before, but I know we have new, new folks all the time. Uh, I, for a long time have been saying, I, it's not that I don't think that there are harms on social networks or, or other parts of the internet, but I think we're all guessing like, well, we know what they are when we don't. And I think yeah. you need to be careful that you don't make a remedy for something that doesn't do any good because you're guessing wrong or makes the problem worse because you misidentified what the problem actually was. And that's what the folks in this study said. They, they were very quick to point out, these are all correlative. Uh, these are not causative. So we're not saying the internet makes you happier. We're saying it's correlated with more well-being and life satisfaction in 85% of these cases. And then to the same way, we're not saying the internet makes uh, women have a less satisfaction, but it's correlated with that in 5% of the cases. And what the study makers were saying is you should take what we've done and do your own exhaustive study that is closer to individual issues that we've identified to find out, okay, is it just correlative or can we determine a cause? And then if you determine a cause, you can more accurately create a remedy for it. Uh, but as they said in the study, remedies for negative effects should not be guided by anecdote. Uh, if everyone just like, well, I think that's harmful. And then you try to remedy it. It might not have been harmful given this study, and maybe you made it harmful by trying to remedy it, uh, or you just didn't do much of anything. You know, maybe, maybe you're just spinning your wheels. The beauty of the internet is its interconnectivity from us to each other. That That's always why I've been an internet optimist is because I do believe in people and I believe in our better nature to have us work toward something that makes us happier, better, and in certain situations, easier to just sort of live your life. Uh, that's what this is. And I think you're right that <laughs> uh, uh, a rush to fix things, oftentimes extraordinarily well-intentioned, is also a part of us connecting. 
is that we want to be able to make things better. We want to be able to make things right. And I, I'm glad that there is at least a touchstone that we can go back to and say, well, maybe we do need a little bit of a first do no harm principle when it comes mm -hmm. to the internet. Yeah. Uh, the, the, there's been a, a, an increasing trend. It's, it's certainly something humans have done throughout history, but an increasing trend of jumping to a conclusion. And by that, I, I, I literally mean saying, well, this is happening and I'm pretty sure that it's the pro it's the cause of this a bad thing and not having the connecting, just saying, well, it's almost as if it's just like, as if, and then using that as a basis for action when that's never re really good. Uh, sometimes you get it right, but sometimes you don't. Uh, and I think what the study says is well, let's not do that. <laughs> let's not jump to the conclusion. If, even if it feels right, that doesn't mean it is let let's find out. And, and I think it's good that they found out 5% of the cases showed a negative effect one, because yeah. that's much lower than a lot of people would assume, but also it says, these are the ones we should focus on. These are the ones that we should put our energy on and not the other ones where we're, we might be fixing something that's not a problem. So uh, I look for this study. It is peer reviewed and it is being published in the journal Technology, Mind and Behavior. Uh, let's unveil another mystery here. Uh, U.S. and Chinese officials are meeting in Switzerland Tuesday to discuss AI security concerns. In, in my opinion, a lot of meetings about AI, and they're all very well-intentioned, and some of them will probably produce great stuff, but this is the one that's going to more likely affect more people's lives directly because these are the two big AI heavyweights, the U.S. and China. The stated topic is to reduce the dangers associated with AI. Uh, so the U.S. Uh, sent Secretary of State Anthony Blinken, A. Blinken, to meet in Beijing last month with Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi. Uh, and as a result of that meeting, they're having this meeting. Now, this meeting's mid-level. The U.S. is sending folks from the White House National Security Council and Departments of State and Department of Commerce. So you're getting the security folks and the export-import folks, uh, the, the folks who want to stop. Uh, the exports and imports and the folks in charge of making sure they stop. China is sending people from its foreign ministry and the National Development and Reform Commission. So you're getting your foreign policy folks from China and your state planning folks, which is in China's system, I guess, sort of equivalent to the Department of Commerce. Uh, they're, not, they're not apples and oranges, but they're both fruit. Uh, this is probably about high-level military security, like making sure an AI doesn't get put in charge of nukes, which they have said it will be about. I'm sure that will be on the agenda. But the guts of these talks, if you ask me, are going to be to see where each other stand in this AI race and whether they can negotiate the equivalent of a detente. Uh, I, I don't know what the best metaphor is, Justin, but, you know, a space race or an arms race of some sort is is pretty close to what's going on, because it's been my opinion that a lot of the stuff we see the U.S. doing in relation to China and China doing in relation to the U.S. Uh, is trying to make sure that each country has the advantage when it comes to developing AI, because neither one of them want the other to get the advantage, because there's a concern that at some point, if you get the advantage in AI, the AI will help you keep that advantage for the rest of eternity. So you have one more, you, 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 you specifically think that this is not only just a general thing, but that this is almost an outshoot of the TikTok ban. I, I don't think that the TikTok divestment law uh, yeah. is, is only about this, but I think this is a, an underpinning of it. Uh, I think the U S is, is looking, I, I call those the, and also we get uh, policy things, right? No, no decision is usually just one effect. It's, it's like, yes, we might reduce X concern, but also if we can hurt ByteDance, that slows down money that is being used to develop algorithms, which slows down AI development. And it's not the only thing that's going to slow down AI, AI development, but it's a, it's a cool side effect of that. So let's here's here's how I look at it. Number one, we there is an advantage right now, and it's advantage the United States in terms right. of AI. They want to keep are, it. We are leading in that, and there are there are, are I think there is a persuasive argument to be made that AI is a particularly troublesome technology for China because of how tightly they control information, and uh, uh, that is something that is inherently 
sort of anathema to AI development that relies on a lot of content and ultimately uh, would be sandboxed down to a smaller product if it is run through the CCP's lens. That being said, ByteDance is an extraordinarily capable company. ByteDance has already developed uh, a couple cool models. Uh, you can play with one of them, I, I think, on Grok that is exceptional. It's an image model. Uh, so I, I don't, this is no slander to ByteDance, but I feel that aside from it being a military thing where we, there, there's an international desire to set up some rules of the road of what you want to plug an LLM into. And if they can all agree to it, then that's something that would become more of an international standard. I don't know how much of this is about business protectionism in this case, at least with these, this level of people talking. I wouldn't call it business protectionism. I would call it the, uh, if you stop punching us, we'll stop punching you, right? Like we want to maintain our advantage. You want to get as close up to us as possible. Uh, is there a way we can reach a steady state? Uh, you know, is, and, and, and that's why an arms race is a, is a good metaphor for it, right? Where you wouldn't think anybody could ever agree uh, on an arms race because everybody always wants to have the advantage. But Soviet Union and the United States did agree to limits on arms. And, and maybe that, that is part of this as well. Now, I don't expect that to come out of this meeting, but I think this meeting is probably one of the first to explore that possibility is my supposition. Because again, it's not about business protectionism, although that is also another side effect that that people don't mind. It's It's about... The United States, I think, is pursuing a policy on the intelligence level of deprive China of every possible advantage they could have uh, in developing AI so that we maintain U.S. superiority. But if, if if this is a stop punching me and I'll stop punching you, it inherently can't be what it is right now, which is ch asking China to stop hitting themselves because they're already working to limit I imports of NVIDIA chips. If you want to lead an AI, either you're developing something that is NVIDIA's quality, which is very, very, very hard to do right now, or good luck catching up. Yeah, that, that's trying to hurt NVIDIA by by reducing the other chips, right? The chips that they yeah. can sell them and they make money off of. So I don't know, man. I think it's I think it's a policy thing. I really I really do. But uh, let it let us know where, where you come down on this side. Feedback at DailyTechNewsShow.com. In fact, if you have feedback about this or anything, you can also talk to us on the social networks at DTNS Show on X, uh, at DTNS Show at MSTDN.social on Mastodon. That's MSTDN.social. Daily Tech News Show is DTNS Show. Uh, at Daily Tech News Show on the aforementioned TikTok. We do not have an account on Duyen as a result of being banned in China. Uh, and DTNS Picks, DTNS PIX on Instagram, and the now also banned in China, threads <laughs> open ai had its big pre-google eio announcement on monday uh, and the centerpiece was a new model uh, an update to gpt4 turbo called gpt4 o one big improvement is with voice. That was the, the big whiz-bang demonstration. And I have to say, they did a pretty good demonstration. Uh, GPT-4 Turbo uses transcription, intelligence, and text-to-speech. So three different elements, three different models that it combines to do talk to me and I'll talk to you back. But because it's bouncing from one to the other, that introduces latency. All three of these happen natively in GPT-4.0. So you just go talk to GPT-4.0 and it gives the answer without having to bounce between models, meaning you can have real-time conversational speech. Uh, you can even interrupt the model. Uh, you can direct emotions and you know tell it to act happier or more dramatic. Uh, it can also recognize images to interact with you. They demonstrated it helping solve an algebra problem. Uh, they demonstrated it talking about some code they had on screen. So it could either be something you're pointing your camera at, or it could be something on your screen. Uh, GPT-4 is now coming to free users. So GPT-4.0, I should say, is coming to free users. Turbo did not because 4.0 is more efficient. Uh, free users can now use GPTs from the GPT store as well. Uh, they can make them for the store as well. And they even targeted us, Justin, in the announcement mm -hmm. by saying, 
podcasters can create content for their listeners. And they looked right at the camera at me. Um, it also means uh, you can use memory to refer back farther in conversation and search through conversations, the improved quality and speed in 50 languages as well. Uh, and if you're wondering, well, then why do I need to pay for it? Uh, paid users get five times the capacity of the free users. So the differentiation is now, do you need it to work better? Do you need five times the capacity? Uh, that's when you pay. GPT-40 comes to the API as well at two times faster, 50% cheaper, and five times higher rate limits than Turbo. And they announced a desktop version of ChatGPT and a refreshed UI. All of this stuff will roll out over the next few weeks. Justin, I know you have a lot of contacts out there uh, who keep their tabs on, on what's going on with this sort of stuff. What are you hearing? So the first big thing is just you cannot understate how important it is that this is all one model. Uh, the, the latency reduction down to a conversational pathway is a game changer. Uh, uh, I would say much in the same way that ChatGPT was a game changer in just bringing LLMs to a wider user base. This is good morning America ready in terms of look what your phone can do. Uh, OpenAI also is very, very conscious about putting this in people's hands as fast as possible. Right before we went online, I was already able to access GPT-40 on the web version. The Mac app is allegedly coming out any minute now. Uh, they are in a speed kills strategy. They want to put this in people's hands ASAP to see how they can do it. The other big thing is because it's one model, it can recognize uh, what I've heard is it can recognize waveforms. So not only is it able to track the visual of what it is seeing, and there's a demo on their YouTube where the open AI is essentially a fifth person on a four person zoom call. And they're having a debate about whether cats or dogs are better. OpenAI remembers everybody's names, remembers what their opinions on cats, cats versus dogs are, and then recaps the conversation at the end. That is something that is extraordinarily powerful when you think about its capabilities. And the fact that they're rolling it out on the API for something that is still very cheap, we're, in, we're still very much in the thick of a land grab period of this technology. And OpenAI is daring anybody to offer a better product for cheap yeah uh i i, I had I had two reactions to this uh, the first was good business move to open up the the gpts the agents the chatbots to the rest of the world uh it seemed to me like the strategy had been have those behind the paywall to test them and that they have gotten as far as they can get with the more limited audience of paying users and now they're following a more regular app store model, which is make this available to everyone for free. Some people will be charging for their GPTs and we'll take a cut of that. It's a, supposedly an engagement related metric about how they share the revenue. So it's a little murky what they get, but they're gonna get something. Uh, and, and that makes sense. You wanna have a big audience using these things, both of developers and customers, if you want it to be successful and start generating money, which can then subsidize you putting GPT-4.0 available for free users all over the place because those free users are more likely to become customers of the GPT store. Uh, and then you can just charge people like, hey, you, you just want more capability. That costs us more on the data center too. Uh, so kick in a few more dollars and, and we can give you that as well. But you're right, it's still in the customer acquisition phase. The other part of this was the surprise of they didn't announce GPT-5. And in fact, they nope. said late Friday, we're not announcing GPT-5 or a search engine, but they still did it the day before Google I.O. And what they announced uh, was essentially in that relation, a really sophisticated voice assistant. Uh, it was an impressive demo. It was a little choppy here and there. I couldn't tell if somebody was muting it backstage or if it was just cutting itself off. Uh, but... That said, even the couple of times it failed, it failed gracefully. Uh, 
and and it failed in a way that shows by the way when it fails it's not the end of the world you can fix it uh my favorite was the guy who said uh read my emotions on my face yeah. and it said i'm looking at a table and he's like oh no no i sent that to you earlier uh look at me look now again. and the model said oh sorry i see what you mean now and then accurately read his emotions uh showing that like hey it was almost a good demo failure in the sense that it showed like yeah you know if, if it does screw up it's just like anybody else you say oh no no that's not what i meant and you carry on as if nothing happened uh justin all of that the day before google does their big ai oriented oh. io announcement on tuesday so let's get into that now, shall we? I don't know what Google has planned. I have I have heard what they demoed for certain elements of their empire. Um, and it's not particularly impressive, at least by my uh, uh, by, by, by my judgment. But here's the bigger problem for Google. They can't do a big demo and have it be impressive because they just got through the, the 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 stuff at the end of last year where they introduced Gemini. They did a lot of things that looked like what OpenAI did. The only difference is OpenAI's works and it's gonna be available on people's phones within the next few days. We'll get into exactly how those phones, how we put on those phones in a second, but even in just their app that they, that they said, they're actually doing the thing that Gemini said it was going to be able to do and it can't really do because they recorded a demo that didn't really match reality of the capabilities of their product. This is a reputational problem for Google. Not only are they behind and we just got a, a, a real, real big hairy example of how far behind they are, but we don't believe them if they do a big demo at IO tomorrow or this week because well, they're kind of the boy that cried wolf at this point. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, they could shoot the moon and and do a demo that proves that it's live somehow, take the big risk, have someone out of the audience that's not a plant, whatever. Uh, maybe that works. The other option for them that, that OpenAI just courted them into is uh, you've got to be IBM. Uh, in the face of a Mac announcement, which means uh, you've got to appeal to folks and go like, yeah, but even if we're a little behind, our, we're solid, we're Google. No one gets fired for, for hiring Google, uh, which isn't exactly the case, but but they, they can, they, they're going to have to lean into the like search end of things, business end of things that they have more experience with, uh, or they're going to have to risk it all and, and, and try to compare themselves, which is going to be no, a They have order. to, because here's the other problem, is that if they want to go enterprise, congratulations, you're now fighting against the greatest uh, enterprise sales team of all time in, in uh, Microsoft, which is Who also has GPT-4.0, by the way, right? By the way. Yeah. And on the other side, look, this was only the front end of their bookends of doom for Google because WWDC is coming up in a month and the rumors are out that the deal between OpenAI and Apple is signed, sealed, and delivered and Siri is now going to be running, quite possibly, GPT-40. And if yeah. that's the case, there's there's going to be a lot of sweaty palms. During. Yeah, if, 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 if you're confused by what Justin just said, saying, I thought Apple was doing it all on device, the cloud stuff would be GPT-40. Yes. The on-device stuff would be your secure personal stuff. And I'm sure Apple will do a bang-up job of explaining, like, hey, when you want the yeah. cloud, it's there, but it's not us. When you want security, that's us, and it's on-device. And that, that will all happen at the beginning of June at WWDC. Uh, yeah. Oh, man, uh, this was an interesting and fun day, which set up an even more interesting and fun day for our Google I.O. coverage tomorrow. Uh, but but for now, uh, Justin, Robert Young, where can folks go to find out more of what you've been up to? Folks, you can take a listen to uh, the We're Not Wrong show featuring myself and Andrew Heaton and Jen Briney. Uh, we're going to be heading out to D.C. It's a sold out show, but uh, go ahead and listen to us anyway. We're Not Wrong. Patrons, stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet. Maybe you got upset when you saw that headline about the internet being good for you. I bet some of you did. Uh, 
you probably just know that this seems counter to public opinion. Uh, we got a few more thoughts on that, on that aspect of it, of like, why do we want to prove that the internet is bad for you? Uh, and you know what? I'm going to guess we have a few more thoughts on OpenAI, so stick around. Mm -hmm. uh, you definitely want to come back tomorrow for the show live, Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC, dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We'll be talking about Google I.O. with Rob Dunwood. See you then. The DTNS family of podcasts, helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>